One year ago this week, a devastating civil war erupted in Sudan when a fragile alliance between the Sudanese armed forces and the paramilitary group, the Rapid Support Forces, collapsed, pitting the two sides against each other. The war initially began around the capital city of Khartoum, but quickly spread to other parts of Sudan, including Darfur, Port Sudan, um, and Gezira state, situated in the country's agricultural heartland. One year on, the conflict has created what the U.N. High Commissioner for Refugees has called, quote, one of the worst displacement and humanitarian crises in the world, and one of the most neglected and ignored. More than 8.6 million people have been driven from their homes, creating the world's largest displacement crisis. A new report by the International Organization for Migration has found 20,000 people are forced to flee their homes in Sudan every day, half of them children. The crisis has been compounded by food insecurity, with the World Food Program recently warning Sudan's facing the world's largest hunger crisis. The number of Sudanese facing emergency levels of hunger, one stage before famine, has more than tripled in a year to almost 5 million, according to the Integrated Food Security Phase Classification, a UN-backed index. Save the Children has warned that 230,000 children, pregnant women and newborn mothers could die of malnutrition in the coming months. Meanwhile, Sudan's health system has collapsed, allowing outbreaks of diseases, including measles and cholera. The war erupted April 15, 2023, when a planned political transition following the ouster and a popular uprising of President Omar al-Bashir, after 30 years in power, fell apart between the Sudanese army and the Rapid Support Forces. For more, we're joined by Khaled Mustafa Medini, an associate professor of political science and Islamic studies at McGill University, chair of the African Studies program there. His recent piece for Merup is headlined, The Struggle for Sudan, a Primer. Welcome back to Democracy Now! It's great to have you here in studio in New York, Professor. If you can start off by um, telling us where Sudan stands one year after the war erupted. Well, first of all, thank you, Amy, for, for having me on the show. It's a real honor. Thank you for, the, for your coverage of, of Sudan. I think that um, where we stand is uh, an unbelievable kind of what the Doctors Without Borders have called a failure of humanity. I think that there are very few crises in the world historically, <clears throat> including in Africa, where there's been such an acceleration in just one year of the kind of devastation that you just itemized. Nine million displaced internally, over a million uh, across the borders, the seven borders of Sudan, mostly in Chad, Egypt, and South Sudan, um, and the complete destruction of the infrastructure. In addition to that, in December of last year, something occurred that has accelerated uh, the famine, basically, uh, not just food insecurity, but the expansion of the famine, and that is the attack on the Jazeera state in central Sudan, which really produces over 60 percent of the agricultural uh, products of, of the country. In addition to that, of course, there are 70 percent of the hospitals that are destroyed. The educational system has completely collapsed. Um, and so the acceleration of this kind of devastation, I don't think we've seen uh, since perhaps maybe the, the genocide in Rwanda. Uh, and I think that uh, compounding that for those of us, of course, concerned about the situation is the lack of attention. To, to, the, to the conflict. Of course, eyes are elsewhere, but that has been a really uh, problematic aspect of, of this conflict so far. Uh, and, Professor, you, you remarked that this is a, uh, this is a, a war that does not have a support uh, for either side among the Sudanese people. Could you talk about that and also the roots of this conflict going back to the revolution of 2017 and 2018, how that informed the, the, uh, the, these current warring parties? Yeah, absolutely. I think one of the, the very kind of unique aspects of this particular war, and local Sudanese have insisted, including in Darfur, one of the most ravaged regions, that this is not a civil war, that this is essentially a war between two generals. Uh, on the one side, um, Abdel Fatih Burhan, who is the head of the Sudan Armed Forces. On the other side, the militia leader, Mohammed Hamdan Dagalo, known as Hemeti. And whereas, uh, in general, civil wars are characterized by, um, you know, two uh, 
uh, groups uh, with uh, you know some kind of significant uh, constituency in civil society supporting one side or the other. In this particular case, uh, the war has absolutely no le legitimacy in civil society and no real constituency for either side. And that, I think, is unique in the history of conflicts in Africa and, I would argue, elsewhere. Uh, the reason for that has very much to do with what you said, and that is the genesis and the root of the war really is uh, the revolution of 2018-2019 that many uh, people followed throughout the world. And what was unique about that particular uh, pro-democracy revolution is that it encompassed the entire country. It wasn't just in the urban areas. It wasn't just in the rural areas. It wasn't just middle-class Sudanese, but Sudanese across social classes, uh, Sudanese across regions, across ethnicities, rose up in late 2018 as a result of uh, uh, implementation of uh, economic policies that raised the price of consumer goods. And it expanded over a six-month period, leading, as you probably know, to the downfall and the ouster of an authoritarian regime led by Omar Bashir that lasted for 30 years and had conducted or executed three different wars in the country. Um, that is really the genesis uh, for viewers and uh, listeners to understand, because this war is essentially a war against that revolution. It's a war against the Sudanese people. Both of these generals, while they uh, have a great deal of competition over resources, over political power, have one thing in common, and that is their fear of this kind of revolutionary potential, and their essentially um, fear of Sudanese civil society. That's why, in addition to all of the kind of devastation that we've been talking about, a key aspect of the targeting has been civilians. Civilians, of course, have been the greatest victims, and not just, uh, you know, randomly. Uh, I'm talking about not only doctors and, uh, and journalists, but also activists and those members of what uh, we call in Sudan and are well known to be the grassroots resistance committees that led the revolution. Uh, those uh, people are either being targeted and killed or expelled from the country uh, or forced to, uh, uh, to, to leave the country. And so that is, becomes a really important aspect of, uh, of the root uh, of this particular kind of conflict in Sudan. And could you talk also about the influence of outside uh, governments uh, on the conflict and in, in preventing a, a ceasefire, the, uh, the, and especially the uh, Egypt and the United Arab Emirates, and, and, and where is the African Union on this? Well, um, it's very important to understand that uh, the external forces had very much to do with supporting what was a fragile coalition uh, between civilian leaders and uh, military leaders. At that time, there was an alliance between these two warring generals, which I think that it's very important to understand. Uh, because of the continued protest for democracy in Sudan, um, by the end of uh, 2022, there was something called a framework agreement, basically talks to bring together civilian leaders and the these generals in order to oversee a transition to democracy. That was overseen by the international community, in particular the United States, uh, Saudi Arabia, the United Arab Emirates, the EU. Um, and their genesis of the external involvement and the failure to see Sudan through a uh, peace and a democratic transition really has to uh, be uh, understood in that context. It was at that point that I would argue that the failure uh, of uh, achieving a civilian transition occurred, and it was, of course, course, a result of the machinations of these two generals, but also the lack of foresight with respect to external actors at the time, uh, specifically the lack of inclusion of the very forces and groups and youth and resistance committees and civil society organizations that uh, really were the ones who uh, uh, mobilized for the revolution. So that is really important. That failure of the framework agreement, it was accelerated, it was not inclusive, and of course, as you know, the catalyst for this war began in in the context of a contentious issue around um, emerging the militias into the standing army. Uh, that, of course, uh, would have led to the lack of autonomy and power of the militia leader who has gone to war against the Sudan Armed Forces. And at the same time, of course, um, the Sudan Armed Forces, uh, Burhan um, at its head, was very concerned about having uh, two command and control institutions. In, in, in essence, he wanted to control uh, the, the country. So to answer your question uh, currently about 
external actors. Uh, that is the genesis of their lack of foresight uh, in terms of really supporting the revolution, in my view. Uh, and uh, to bring it up to date, um, the kind of vi variety of interest, uh, Egypt's interest in and support of the Sudan Armed Forces, uh, the United Arab Emirates' support of the militia, um, and Saudi Arabia's support also of the Sudan Armed Forces, has led to this situation we, where we have up to uh, three or four different peace initiatives, one in Saudi Arabia, uh, headed by the U.S., uh, one in, um, in Djibouti, headed by IGAD, the regional bloc, um, another um, headed by the UAE that was recently held in Bahrain, basically uh, competing peace initiatives that have obstructed, number one, a resolution to the conflict in terms of implementing a ceasefire, but also motivated these two generals, uh, because basically they're uh, utilizing their patrons, whether it, uh, outside forces, in order to perpetuate the war against the Sudanese people. So I hope that makes sense, but we do have to get back and understand the initial failures of the international community in really implementing a peace agreement that would really satisfy um, the, you know, kind of the, the, the roots of the problems in Sudan, but most specifically those forces, including resistance committees, young people, civil society organizations that mobilized for the revolution. The reason I mentioned that is that any resolution to this conflict would require getting back to that and understanding, uh, given that this is a war against the civilian population, uh, the, the support must be given to the civilian population and immediately be included in any peace initiative that would seek to resolve this conflict. Uh, professor, on Monday, the French president, Emmanuel Macron, announced that donors had pledged more than $2 billion to Sudan. He was speaking at an international conference in Paris aimed at increasing humanitarian aid to Sudan. Even if today there are far too many conflicts, and they are conflicts that are covered more by the press and diplomatic efforts, our duty was to make it clear that we are not forgetting what is happening in Sudan, that we remain mobilized, that there are no double standards. We can announce that more than 2 billion euros will be mobilized for the women and men of Sudan. Before this conference, we had a commitment of 190 million euros. This evening, we are at 2 billion euros for Sudan. So that's French President Emmanuel Macron at this international conference in Paris. If you can talk also about the role of France, but overall, what the international community can do to be most supportive to ending this war. Well, of course, it's good news. Uh, the, the most, the priority, of course, is to address the humanitarian crisis. There is absolutely no question about that. The two billion euros is important. Uh, there have been a lot of different initiatives uh, on the part of the United Nations. Uh, very few have met uh, the targets, and uh, this is one of the reasons Doctors Without Borders has called it a failure of humanity because of the lack of, of donor, uh, um, you know, kind of uh, pledges and support. The two billion euros are important, but it's very important to understand that one of the central aspects of this conflict is the way that these two parties are using food delivery and aid delivery as a weapon of war, um, not only in terms of targeting aid workers, but also, you know, setting up bureaucratic blo uh, blockages, uh, refusing permits for aid workers. And the reason I mention that is the $2 billion is extremely important. But the problem is that without a really vigorous political intervention, without understanding that uh, this aid uh, must be um, really um, kind of implemented or uh, utilized in the context simultaneously with a vigorous political uh, intervention that seeks to stop the war. Um, and the reason I say that is the, uh, one of the most important problematics at the moment, as I mentioned, is the lack of coherent coordination on the part of external actors, with France and the EU, of course, pledging this money, um, um, Canada and the United States uh, utilizing sanctions against uh, these two generals. Uh, but a lack of coordination that would, A, include civil society organizations to set the agenda for a ceasefire uh, and to uh, implement that kind of ceasefire. And also, this kind of pledge, uh, while it's so important, uh, it really uh, is not, does not make up for the destruction of the distributive networks uh, in Sudan. Aid is uh, an absolutely important aspect, but what is happening now is so severe in terms of food insecurity and the famine uh, that the support of uh, local Sudanese, including um, organizations that 
that were transformed from resistance communities into voluntary uh, voluntary association like emergency response rooms. So what we need is a, a very vigorous political intervention coordination between the different actors, and I'm talking about the, the Gulf countries, the United States, Europe, and the African countries. All of them have a stake in this conflict. The reason that this, uh, this pledge has gone through, one of the reasons is the recognition on the part of external actors, to be quite honest, Amy, that uh, the, there is not only a huge humanitarian crisis, but the spillover effect across the region, the Red Sea region, the strategic areas that are of such concern to the Gulf countries, to the United States, to Europe, the issue of migration. All of that uh, necessitates a coordinated understanding of the problem or of the intervention, that everyone has a great deal to lose from this conflict. Um, uh, so the pledge is important and very, very important, uh, uh, useful and vital, but without a political coordinated intervention that includes civil society forces and supports um, local Sudanese organizations uh, like the emergency response rooms, the DATFOR Association, uh, and others, um, we won't really see kind of uh, the restoration of peace. And Professor, I just have one uh, a question that maybe you could address briefly. A war of this uh, of this length obviously requires weapons. Who is supplying the weapons to both sides, and what could be done to put pressure on the arms suppliers of the of the warring parties? Um, well, the problem is that in the Sahel region, in Africa in general, um, the smuggling of arms is something that is very difficult to control completely. Um, what we call the sm small arms trade that is uh, really encompasses the entire Sahel region. Um, one of the issues of the arms supplies for the militias has to do previously with the supply of arms that was brought in by United Arab Emirates. That is something that is well known. Uh, you know, the Russian Wagner Group also was uh, facilitating arms to the militia. Um, the arms that uh, the Sudan Armed Forces have, of course, uh, number one, uh, has to do with its own stock. It is the Sudan Armed Forces and had received a lot of arms supplies recently as they began to le lose uh, the war, particularly in the after the, the fall of Jazeera, the central state. They have been getting arms and drones from Iran um, as a last resort because of the grave situation they find. So we have uh, Gulf countries involved, Iran involved, the small arms trade. Um, that uh, requires, of course, um, uh, great attention. There have been sanctions implemented against uh, the financing of these arms uh, through the corporations uh, of uh, both the militia leaders and the, the Sudan Armed Forces, um, who are supported, I want to add, by extremist Islamists uh, as the only small coalition left to support them. Uh, so there is a complex of external actors um, and uh, uh, of informal trade of arms. Uh, that is important to pay attention to, but without really looking at uh, the ways to implement a ceasefire and restore p peace, uh, it's just a stopgap kind of, uh, of um, you know, policy or intervention. So it is important, but once again, we have to really bring these uh, regional actors into play. The United States, as you know, has finally um, appointed a special envoy to Sudan, who has, uh, interestingly enough, uh, re reiterated uh, much of what I'm saying, and that is that there needs to be a coordination among the regional actors, the ending of arms supplies by certain actors to the different warring parties. And interestingly enough, he has also emphasized uh, the importance of taking civil society seriously. And I would like to also mention that, and this is very key, that he has al also mentioned, as the majority of Sudanese have mentioned, despite the severity of this conflict, there is only one solution and only one uh, interest on the part of the majority of Sudanese, 99 percent of Sudanese, and that is the restoration of full civilian democracy. I know it's counterintuitive. It seems difficult at this stage to think uh, a post-war in Sudan. Uh, but uh, there is, I think, that uh, even if the, of the American envoy has recognized, as I've said in this program a couple of times, uh, that because of the lack of constituency, the lack of legitimacy, uh, the kind of venal uh, kind of instrument 
instrumental, self-interested, political and economic objectives of these two warring parties, there is absolutely no other way to resolve this conflict except to support the vast majority of the civilian population and Sudanese inside and outside, and to continue what we call the objectives of what Sudanese call al-Sawr al-Majida, the glorious revolution. Uh, that is really the only solution, and this is what um, even the, the special the, the U.S. envoy has reiterated, and I would argue primarily because he's been talking to Sudanese.